Hello guys, welcome to another lecture. So today we're going to be looking at antigen processing for T-cell activation. So just a reminder, T-cells orchestrate our cell-mediated immunity and regulate our B-cell responses to most antigens. Understanding T-cells and their actions in adaptive immune responses is important for the control of allergies, autoimmune diseases, and the rejection of transplanted organs. So last time we saw, two lectures ago I believe, was endogenous antigens, looking at class 1 MHC. So now we're looking at MHC class 2, looking at extracellular exogenous antigens. And we'll learn this pathway as we go through the lecture. So processing antigen. So the exogenous pathway used by antigen preventing cells, which are macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. We can see the peptides are presented by class 2 MHC and are generated in acidified and acidic vesicles. So exogenous antigen is taken up mainly by phagocytosis or receptor-mediated endocytosis. Antigens enter the endosomes and they fuse the lysosome and this forms the phagolysosome. And these ves we have vesicle acidification. So we have an acidic interior at a pH of around four. The activation of de degradative enzymes allows us to process the proteins into peptides. So here we go from our protein to peptides. The endosome fuse with the vesicles containing the class 2 MHC proteins. So you see that here. And this complex of peptides in class 2 MHC is transported to the APC surface and presented. So this is taken up to the surface and presented to our T cells. So here's another view. So here's the start. So exogenous antigen is taken up mainly by phagocytosis. So here it's being phagocytosed or endocytosed or receptor mediated endocytosis. The antigen enters the endosome. So here's our early endosome right here. And it fuses with the lysosome, forming our phagal lysosome. Again, we have our acidic interior at four, and these degradative enzymes process the protein into peptides. This endosome will fuse with the vesicles containing the class 2 MHC protein. So here we can see. And this complex of peptides in the class 2 are transported to the surface, as we can see here. So essentially the same thing in the last slide, but just a different kind of graphic. So how do we prevent class 2 MHC from binding to endogenous peptides? So MIMAL and the endoplasmic reticulum, our class 2 MHC proteins are synthesized. These associate with invariant chains, or LI, which is aka CD74, which is the chaperone. So this LI, or the invariant chain, blocks class 2 MHC binding of peptides in the endoplasmic reticulum and guides folding. This has signals directing class 2 MHC to acidic endosomal compartment. So during the transport, MHC class 2 protein invariant chain is cleaved by clip. So this is a fragment of the invariant chain bound to class 2. So the invariant chain binds in the groove of the MHC class 2. We can see that here. Invariant chain is cleaved initially and leaves a fragment bound to the class 2 molecule and to the membrane. Further cleavage leaves a short peptide fragment called clip bound to the class 2 MHC. So here's another figure of it. So clip fills this groove, but lacks a sorting signal for the acidic endosomal compartment, so class 2 can leave. So the invariant chain directs newly synthesized class 2 MHC molecules to acidified intracellular vesicles. So here we got an overall process of endogenous antigen presentation. So we'll come back to this figure if you want to take an overview, but we'll break it down. So here we have our first step. So class 2 MHC proteins have an invariant chain which binds the newly synthesized class 2 MHC. This blocks the binding of the peptide in the ER. And the MHC class 2 proteins leave the ER and go to the Golgi apparatus through the endocytotic pathway. This invariant chain prevents peptide binding class 2 molecules during the transport in endocytic vesicles. And this also directs class 2 proteins to acidic endosomal compartment, which we'll discuss next. Again, here's our invariant chain, which forms a complex with MHC class 2. And these blocking pep and the blocking the sorry, blocking the binding of peptides in the misfolded proteins. So in the acidified endosomes, the invariant chain is cleaved. This progressively this means we'll have a progressively shorter fragments 
until, until we get our short fragment called clip. So eventually we'll have our clip in here. So we can see here, we can see we're going from this big lip 10, it's slowly being broken down, and then eventually we'll have a short fragment clip. So clip still blocks peptide binding, but lacks a sorting signal for the acidic endosomal compartment. So class two proteins can move to the cell surface and encounter antigen peptides. So endosomes with class two MEC and invariant chains are progressively acidified, as we said, activating the protease that cleaves the invariant chain into clip. Sorry. So these phagocytose pathogens are degraded in acidic endosomes, producing peptides. These are encountered by class two MEC in the endosomes, but the class two MEC binding group is still occupied by clip, so there's no peptide binding. So here, however, this is a virus. It's broken down, but its clip is still there. So the invariant chain is cleaved. <laughs> Sorry, my cat's running around. Cleaved in an acidified endosome, leaving a short peptide fragment with clip still bound to the MSC2 molecule, as we see here. The endocytose antigens are degraded to peptides, like we discussed in the endosomes, but clip with the peptide blocks the binding of the MSC2 to antigen. So another chaperone called HLADM helps clip help exchange clip for the peptide, which is important. So this binds to the class two. So HLADM binds to class two, causing a conformational change in the peptide groove. So here's our HLADM binding to our class two. See, so we can see that conformational change releasing clip, and this catalyzes clip and releases and stabilizes class two molecules. So this is an ongoing process. So this binds and rebinds to the HLADM which removes peptides that are unstable and weakly bound to class 2 MSC. So essentially, we have peptide editing. So we, whatever one binds the best, we'll keep going until we have that optimal binding. And finally, our MSC class 2 and peptide forms a stable complex through this peptide editing, and this is presented to the surface of the APC. So here we have our class 2 peptide complexes, which may need to be stable on APC surfaces for days before the right T-cell sees them. So this through peptide editing by HLA-DM, which promotes stable complexes. Peptides of low affinity in the class two group are replaced by peptides of higher affinity. So it's essentially kind of a type of affinity maturation, but not necessarily, but it works in a similar premise. This promotes higher stable class twos and peptide complexes, so stronger binding. So again, HLA-DM comes in, and this can happen over and over again until we get the optimal binding, and then we'll present the cell. So exogenous antigen processing. So just a quick overview. We have our invariant chain, which blocks the binding of peptides to the MSC class 2 in the ER. In vesicles, the invariant chain is cleaved, leaving clip fragment, as we said. Clip blocks the binding of MSC to the in the vesicle. Then we have our HLA-DM come in, allowing for peptides to bind. So what are these outcomes? So the T-cell receptor recognizes complexes of antigen and MHC. So co-receptors interact with MHC proteins, and these are our T-helper cells. So CD4 goes to MHC class 2. The result of this is our activated T-helper cells, which are involved in cytokine production. And, these, and this cytokine production provides help for B-cells, activation of our CDLs, and phagocytic cells. So these are very important. And again, here's our interaction between our APC and our helper T-cell. So the expression of our, so here we'll have an example of a class two MHC expression on a dendritic cell, and we'll look at the role of March one. So March one stands for membrane associated ring finger, kind of an interesting name, but we can see here in immature dendritic cells, March one ubiquinates MHC molecules, targeting them for degradation. So here's our March 1, causing ubiquination, target them for degradation. This activation stops the transcription of March 1 gene, increasing the lifetime of MHC molecules. So here we can see March 1 half-life is approximately 30 minutes. So MHC molecules accumulate on the cell surface, presenting peptides they acquired at the time of gingeric cell activation. So another way to look at this is so... March 1 is ubiquitin ligase, we can see here, causes ubiquitinization, that tags class 2 MHC proteins 
for proteosomal destruction. This decreases the surface expression of our class 2. So March 1 expression is decreased during an infection after toll-like receptor signaling. This allows dendritic cells to express more class 2 peptide complexes on the surface when needed most. So essentially, when we don't need it, it's not going to be there. And when we need it, we can have it. So we also need co-stimulatory molecules such as CD86, also known as B7-2, which you've talked about a little bit earlier. Expression is also March 1 regulated, so it increases on activated dendritic cells. And again, our T cells need to be activated with a co-stimulatory molecule. So the fact that March 1 can produce both pretty much allows it to work optimally. So what are some evasion strategies that they avoid MHC class 2? So they can have escape from the endosome or the phagosome before it fuses with the lysosome, so it avoids being digested and therefore presented. And here are examples, shigella and listeria. Some pathogens can alter the phagosome environment and prevent digestion. So two and three. Those are examples. And this includes mycobacterium. And these can inhibit the acidification or fusion of the lysosomes, as we see here, the lysosome. Some pathogens can trap the class 2 MHC proteins inside the vesicles. We saw this with MHC1 as well. And these prevent the presentation at the surface. And one parasite is an example. Some can produce proteins that act as March 1, as March 1 does. So this decreases class 2 MHC expression. And certain viruses can do this. So there are some um, exceptions to the rule. In a few cases, we can break this rule where we have cross-presentation of antigen. So some dendritic cells present exogenous antigens on the class 1, unlike in their normal situation, and activate CDLs. This process is still debated, but there are several possibilities. So ingested proteins, so exogenous antigens, and the phagolysosome either translocate or leak. And this goes into the cytosol, we can see here, these leak into the cytosol and are created by proteasome. Then we have our TAP, which transports it to the ER. And this is loaded onto our MHC class 1 molecules. So similar pathways as we saw before. If you want a refresher on endogenous antigens, check out, the, I believe it's two lectures ago. So peptides may be transformed, transported from a phagolysosome directly into a vesicular compartment. And this means that it will interact with a mature MHC class 1 molecule en route to the surface. Cross-presentation allows exogenous proteins to be presented by class 1 MHCs by a subset of APCs. So essentially, this is a function for antigen-presenting cells to show class 1 MHC. So these antigen-presenting cells can also get infected by viruses and stuff like that. So this is kind of their one of their ways to do that. So here's an animation of an endogenous antigen processing, which starts with exogenous virus proteins entering the cell through phagosome, leaking into the cytosol, and being processed through endogenous route. So here we can see our lysosome. But also just note that the initial steps here show an endogenous route of entry into the cell. So this illustrates our cross-presentation. See the endogenous antigens enters the proteasomes and are degraded into propeptide. Here we can see the proteasome degrading the antigen. So we have peptides enter the ER through TAP transporters. The ER transports MHC1 molecules with bound to the peptide to the Golgi apparatus or complex. It's a little slow. The Golgi complex transports the MHC1 peptide complex to the surface of the cell. Now we have our MHC1 peptide. Yeah, so just let this play again if you want, and you guys can just uh, replay it if you want to see it again. So some key points. MHC proteins present antigen process through different routes. So our class 1 presents through endogenous antigens and activates CD8 T cells. Our class 2 present exogenous and activates CD8 T helper cells. And only MHC proteins bound peptide Bound with peptide are stable on the cell surface, so there's no empty MHCs ever being used. MHC polymorphism is an important is important to allow us to pre present a diverse range of antigenic peptides. 
MHE structure allows for recognition and diverse range of peptides, but still allows interaction with conserved molecules on T cells, including CD8 and CD4. But as we mentioned, some pathogens have evasion mechanisms to avoid antigen processing for both class 1 and class 2. So we're now going to look at some immunodeficiency issues. So just keep in mind these questions. What happens when we don't have class 1? When we don't have class 2? And what would be some more severe? So here again is a picture of the two pathways. In some conditions, we can have knockout of different things where it happens, so just keep that in mind. So one example is class 1 bare lymphocyte syndrome. So in this, in this disease, class 1 MHC expression is impaired on the cell surface in all cells. This is because there's a defect in the TAP transporter protein, not the class 1 molecules themselves. So here we can see we have a malfunction in our TAP, which is our transporter protein, so we won't be able to tr transport it to the surface. So this lack of TAP results in a lack of peptide transport into the ER from the cytoplasm, which is an important step. We can see here antigen into the ER. And this results in a lack of stable class 1 MHC. And class 1 MHC remain in the ER and are not transported to the cell surface. So again, think to yourself, what might this be a problem? So again, we talked about MHC being involved in CTL slash CD8. T cells. So again, what are those super important for? We looked at our intracellular viruses and stuff like that. So now we have class 2. Well, this looks at uh, is impaired class 2 MHC expression, class 2 Barth lymphocyte syndrome. So here we can see. Here was our class 1 Barth lymphocyte syndrome. So this results in a defect in the transcription factor C CITA or CIITA which is class 2 transactivator. So lactin CIDA causes impaired production of class 2 MHC molecules on ABC. So here we have CIDA not working. And again, we cannot process it. Outcomes, so again, this is quite severe as we have no MHC2 and therefore no CD4 T cells, which remember we said CD4 helps B cells, innate immunity, releases cytokines, so these all help direct the entire immune system. So without these, it can be quite disastrous. So just a refresher, in a sense, to kind of put in perspective here. With our, without our CD4, we won't get our B-cell response, at least a good one. So in a sense, without our class 2, we don't get our T-helper cell response, which results in T-cell help for the B-cells. Therefore, this proliferation and all these steps don't happen. So as we said, presentation of peptides by MHC molecules on antigen-presenting cells activates T-cells through their T-cell receptor. In combination with signaling through the B-cell receptor, T-cells drive B-cell development in the lymph node. So if we have class 2 or class 1, you can see that all these functions, all these functions will be affected. So in class 1, bare lymphocyte syndrome, our CD8 memory T-cells can proliferate. This in a normal reaction, they can proliferate and encounter a pathogen, but this will be lost. And you can see in kind of a comparison, you're kind of losing more in this scenario. So naive T cells. So now we're going to move on to the T cell activation. So naive T cells encounter antigen while we're recirculating through secondary lymph node organs, which we said like our spleen and lymph nodes. These naive T cells can then leave the blood at high endothelial venules or HEVs and enter the lymph node cortex and interact with the APCs, usually dendritic cells which you can see depicted here. Naive T-cells interact with APCs and scan for the correct peptide MHC complex presented by your APCs. So we can see T-cells that encounter specific antigen proliferate and differentiate into effector cells. Here we can see, and this is occurring in the lymph node. And this is our high endothelial venule. So what happens when a T-cell sees antigen? So this is our Big figure to summarize pretty much everything we're about to go through of the process of T-cell activation. So again, if you want to take a look at this first, we'll come back to this figure again. But essentially, this is sums up the entire process we're going to talk about. And yeah, just come back to it, take pause to go through it if you would like. Then again, here's kind of the drawing. This is kind of the text version. 
this is kind of the illustration of all the different receptors and stuff we'll need to look at. So how do they send intracellular signals? So here we just have the structure of the T-cell receptor, and as we can see, it's close to the immunoglobulin or B-cell receptor. So here's kind of the comparison. But the T-cell receptor is made of two types of protein chains and uses the immunoglobulin full domain. So we have our alpha-beta chains and our variable regions and our constant regions and the disulfide bonds. And again, we have alpha-beta and gamma-delta T-cells. So there's two different receptor types, but they're essentially the same other than their chains. So all T-cells contain something called CD3. So this is a closer look at the T-cell receptor. So we have a T-cell receptor and CD3 and Zeta, which pretty much is always there. And these are also called CD247. The T-cell receptor is a complex of six chains, delta, gamma, and two epsilon chains in CD3, plus a pair of Zeta, Zeta, or Zeta N, or Zeta Eta, and they are paired. So what is the role of the CD3 complex, which we can see here? The role of the CD3 is signal transduction. So as we've seen before, we've seen these ITAMs, which again, activator, which ITAMs stand for immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motifs. And these ITAMs recruit something called, they send recruit signaling proteins called tyrosine kinases, in this case, ZAP70. So here we see our T normal T-cell receptor, alpha, beta. Then we see our CD3, with our epsilon and delta, and gamma, epsilon. Then we see our zetas and our ITAMs. So here's we're going to look at class 2, class 1. Here we see a CD8, and here we see CD4. So again, CD4 to class 2, CD1 to class 1. So CD4 and CD8 and MHC. So we said this before, we just discussed that. So why are CD4 and CD8 needed? These are needed to improve the affinity of T-cell interaction with the APC. This increases the strength of, signal trans of the signal transmitted by the T-cell receptor with the APC. CD4 and CD8 have associated tyrosine kinase called LIC. Interesting name. So the CD4 and CD8 accessory molecules also contribute to T-cell receptor interactions with APC. They help stabilize cell-to-cell -cell association and strengthens the signaling through the T-cell receptor CD3 complex. So now we're going to take a look at APC T-cell interactions. So here we have a T-cell initially binding to an APC through the low infinity LFA slash ICAM interactions. So we've seen these molecules before. These are types of integrins. See here the centrin. We've seen this on the endothelium when we looked at neutrophil rolling. Then we have subsequent binding of the T-cell receptors, signals the LFA. So this binding signals LFA. This results in a conformational change in the LFA, which increases affinity and prolongs the cell contact. So it essentially gets stronger. So these cell surface adhesion molecule interactions add stability to the APC T-cell binding. We have transient and adhesive interactions between the T-cell and APCs, which are stabilized by specific antigen recognition. T-cell receptor recognition of the antigen MHC complex results in signal transduction through this T-cell receptor CDR3 complex. And this causes a conformational change in the adhesion molecules LFA. LFA then binds to ICAMs on the APC with higher affinity and helps stabilize the cell-to-cell -cell interaction. So this kind of interaction has also been labeled as the immune synapse, similar to the analogy of our neural synapses. So this is the a neural immune synapse is the area of contact between a T cell and the cell it's interacting with, which is usually APC or B cell. That is formed by protein-protein interactions in contact area between cells. These contact areas include the C-SMAC, which is a central supramolecular activation complex, and the P-SMAC, which is a peripheral supramolecular activation complex. So here we have our outer ring of red is the our P SMAC, and then the inner circle in green is our C SMAC. And we can see here the different things involved. And here's more of a graphic depiction. So this is kind of zoomed out. We can see here this is zoomed out. So this is a confocal image on the right here, where our T cell receptor peptide MC complexes in red. We have our LFA and ICAM complexes in green. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting looking. 
So in the immune synapse, we kind of have cytoskeletal reorganization, which is important in the T-cell B-cell interactions. So this immune synapse guides directed cytokine secretion. So here we see our secretory domain. When T-cell receptors recognize peptide MSC complex on the angiopresentic cell, this receptor reorganize, causes, there's receptor reorganization, which occurs in the plasma membranes of both cells. So we can see there's T and B cell interactions between cell surface molecules and immune synapse, leading to cytokine release from the T cell targeted toward the B cell, and this results in more efficient B cell activity. So again, here's our CSMAC, PSMAC, which involves our integrins, secondary L LFA and ICAM, where the CSMAC involves our T cell, T cell receptor MHC binding and cytokine release. We also have actin polymerization, which plays a role in reorganization process. This defects in proteins inducing actin polymerization can result in immune deficiency due to in inefficient T cell help for B cells. This is known as Wiskott Algen syndrome. So, what interacts in the immune synapse? So, we have cell throughout. Cell cell interactions between the MHC peptide on the APC with the T cell receptor. So here we see that. Class 2 MHC with the CD4. We have costum thermogels, including our CD80, B, CD80, 86, which are our B7s. We also have, you know, which is with CD8, sorry. So our CD, our B7s always bind to CD28. We also have adhesion molecules in ICAM and LFA1. You can see here. ICAM on the APC with LFA1 on the T cell. And the synapse includes singly molecules inside the T cell as well. So here's that tyrosine kinase we saw earlier. It was MYC and ZAP70. So singling by the T cell receptor CD, uh, CD3 complex gets underway. So when the T-cell receptor binds to the antigen MHC complex, the T-cell receptor interacts with the CD3 and Zeta chains. So again, we had our Zetas and our CD3, which are these. The CD4 interaction with the class 2 MHC results in a CD4 conformational change. So we can see that here. So this T-cell receptor co-receptor complex forms. This brings Lick as we can see here, into the complex, and this phosphorylates the ITAMs in CD3, gamma, delta, epsilon, and zeta chains. So this signal induction process is mediated by CD3 after the T cells recognize the antigen, only after. And these ITAMs are shown in yellow, as they're shown in most figures. So engagement of co-receptors with the T cell receptor enhances ICAM phosphorylation. So here we can just look at the process. So in a resting T cell, the ITAMs are not phosphorylated. The binding of the MHC ligand to the T cell receptor leads to the phosphorylation of the ITAMs by receptor-associated kinases, kinases. And we also have additional kinases, which then act, which include ZAP70. So this kinase we talked was lick, included lick, but we also have ZAP70. And here we can see lick and ZAP70 Lick activates ZAP70. So here's the Lick, ZAP70. When the co-receptor binds to the MHC ligand, ZAP70 binds to phosphorylated zeta chains, ITAMs, and is phosphorylation is phosphorylated and activated by Lick. But Lick is a multiple step process, activating Lick. So Lick is tightly activity is tightly regulated. It is controlled by tyrosine phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Lick is actually held in an inactive form and is IE phosphorylated. Red it indicates stop. So how does it become activated? We have CD45 to the rescue. So CD45 is a tyrosine that phosphat a tyrosine phosphatase. It dephosphorylates lick and causes it to move to its active conformation, and now we have our primed lick, which you can see CD5 it comes in here and now it's primed. Here's our primed lick. When lick is primed, it's ki it has kinase activity, and therefore it autophosphorylates, resulting in a fully active lick. We can see here this fully active lick acting on the zeta chains, and activates. So it activates a lick, and it phosphorylates the CD3 on the zeta chains, which are essentially those little red dots. 
on the ITAM. And LIC is associated with CD4 and CD8 T cells. And we can see your ITAMs again in the yellow. So here's a little recap. So our T cell receptor will bind to the antigen MHC complex. T cell receptor interacts with CD3 zeta chains, activating the ITAMs. CD4 binds to class 2 MHC, and we have a conformational change in CD4. This brings LIC into the complex. As we said, CD4, this is usually in an active form. So we have CD5, which activates LIC. Then this LIC will phosphorylate the ITAMs on CD3 chains, both gamma, delta, epsilon, and zeta. Next, we have the ZAP70 that we discussed, which docks on phosphorylated ITAMs of CD3 complexes. So this ZAP70 is phosphorylated by LIC, and now ZAP70 is an active kinase. So yeah, it's a pretty crazy pathway. But yeah, ZAP70 is recruited by tandem SH2, domains to the ITAMs, and it's phosphorated by LIC. Can you see that here? So this active ZAP70 then recruits and phosphorylates scaffold proteins. We have LAT, which is linker of activated T cells, and SLP76. Linker of activated T cells, or LAT, and SLP76 are linked by an adapter protein called GADS. Here's our GADS. So here's our SLP76 and our LAT held together by GADS. So this complex recruits phospholipase C gamma, which is the PLC gamma. We've seen this before in the other process, but this binds to the phosphorylated scaffold proteins LAT and SLP76. So here's our PLC gamma. Now it's coming in and binding. This PLC gamma is activated by a membrane associated tyrosine kinase called ITK, which you can see here. And we can see the co stimulatory signal is also needed for full activation of PLC gamma. So PSL, PLC gamma is the gatekeeper for T cell activation. So act, activation of PLC gamma is controlled at several levels. So without this, we're not going to have activation. So that's why it's highly controlled because we don't want this acting out of control or when we don't need it. So this PLC gamma, the gatekeeper, which is for T cell activation. This is because activation of PLC gamma is controlled at several levels. So again, here's that figure in a uh, horizontal way now. So the result of all the signaling and all these different complex pathways is the activation of phospholipase C pathway and mitogen activated protein kinase pathway. This is also seen as MAPK quite often. And this leads to the activation of transcription factors, which control cytokine gene expression. So again, SLP76 and LAT, they combine with GARD, GADS, ITK, and PLC gamma. This activates PLC gamma, and here we see PLC gamma being activated through ITK. Other outcomes of T cell recepting also occur, are also occurring. So ZAP70 phosphorylates the scaffold proteins LIT and SLP76 as well and initiates four downstream signaling modules. So here we have this activation, and here are four downstream molecules, and we'll discuss these. So signaling molecules will lead to events that help T cells become activated. So PLC activation results in transcription, transcription factor activation, and again, cytokine gene expression. We have increased metabolic activity, reorganization of the cytoskeleton, and increased adhesion molecule efficiency. So when we have the ZAP70 activation, phosphorylating LAT and SLP, we can have AKT activation, which leads to increased cellular metabolic activity, as we discussed here. PLC gamma activation leads to transcription factor activation over here, producing cytokines. VAV activation leads to active actin polymerization and cytoskeletal reorganization, allowing for optimal T cell function. We also have something called the ADAPT, recruitment which leads to enhanced integrant adhesiveness and clustering so again all these work to improve t-cell function so here's kind of a, a summary figure of the phos uh of what happens when we have a phosphorylation of pc gamma so phospholipase phospholipase c like we said is plc gamma cleaves phosphotinyl linosol biphosphate pip2 to diacylglycerol or DAG and inosyl triphosphate IP3, 
So here we got our IP3 and diacylglycerol. Diacylglycerol stays in the membrane and activates PKC0. So here, protein kinase C. And this results in a kinase cascade and the activation of NF-kappa B. So we've seen NF-kappa B before, and this, this transcription factor results in several cytokines. So this was seen in, in that innate immunity, but it's a similar pathway. And results of transcription activation, so yeah. Like we've seen before, if you want more information about NF-kappa B, you can check out my innate immunity lectures. So uh, on, the, on the other side of this, we have IP3, which diffuses to the cytosol and opens calcium channels. So these calcium increased calcium channels will cause elevated cytosolic calcium. And this results in calcineurin, which is a phosphatase, resulting in NFAT. We can also have the MAP kinase, or MAPK, cascade is also activated by AP1, which is activator protein 1. So together, these pathways lead to the activation of transcription factors and transcriptional activation in the T cell. So here we can see T cell interaction with presented antigen through intracellular signaling. So the activation of transcription factors, including NF kappa B, NFAT, and activator protein 1, result in cytokine gene transcription, including IL 2 and others, as well as IL 2 receptor expression including IL-2 receptor alpha chain. So this expression is, this will result in increased expression of the hyphen D IL-2 receptor on the T-cell surface. So this NFA, NF-kappa B activation is mediated by protein kinase C, or PKC, which you'll see it written as quite a bit. And this pathway has many similarities to TLR signaling, and we'll discuss that soon. So the activation of NF-kappa B occurs in T-cell signaling, as in TLR signaling, like we discussed. The final stages of activation, we can see, involve calcineurin activity, which can be blocked by certain drugs like cyclosporin A, used in transplantation therapy to prevent transplant rejection. So again, in a lot of these processes, there are many places where we can stop an interaction. So in this sample, this is an example, this is an immunosuppressive drug. So like we said, T-cell receptor signaling shares some features with TLRs. So we've seen this kind of figure again. So this, these sections look a little different, but here, as we get to here, we can see similar pathways here where the I, where I kappa complex. So we got our Nemo, beta and alpha and our ubiquitin. Then again, we have our I kappa B being removed and allowing NF kappa B to work as a transcription factor producing cytokine. So NF, NF kappa B activation is mediated by protein kinase C Diacylglycerol recruits protein kinase C to the membrane where PKC phosphorylates the scaffold protein, karma 1. These are karma 1 and our PKC. The next steps are similar to the TLR signaling. So our scaffold protein, which is now karma 1, forms a complex with other proteins and recruits ubiquitin ligase, or TRAF6. So here we can see it's being recruited and then now it will bind. This results in a polyubiquitin scaffold, and this phosphorylates IKK, or the IK complex, including NEMO. This IK complex phosphorylates IKappa B, which is the inhibitory protein which keeps NF-kappa B inactive. So this IKappa B is degraded, NF-kappa B is free, and as the nucleus increases transcription factor of genes. So essentially, once we get here, pathway becomes essentially identical to TLRs. What we can see here, we have our new different factors, a different scaffold, and yeah, we have TRAF6. So again, we mentioned how knowing all these details allows us to have different interventions that can block certain aspects. So we can see we can have medications that can, again, just for this example, we're looking at calcineurin. So we can block the ability of calcineurin to activate NFAT, which is immunopharmacological control point. So now we're going to a little more detail about the role of calcineurin and how it works. So phospholipase C, as we said, P PLC gamma, cleaves, phospho cleaves PIP2 to diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate, so our IP3 and DAG. So our IP3 is cleaved. So again, there's that one figure if we go back where we had our PLC gamma and then broken down and then it went down into IP3. And DAG. So if you want to go back to the figure, it's a good way to look at it. 
So we're going to be focusing on this pathway. So this is where we had our calcium. And this one ended up in NF kappa B. But we're going to be focusing on this pathway where we had calcium. So IP3 causes elevated cytosolic calcium levels in two ways. So IP3 diffuses into the cytosol and opiates calcium ion channels in the ER, which elevates cytoplasmic calcium levels. This decreased calcium levels in the ER causes aggregation of calcium sensor, called STIM. This opiates calcium channels through ORI1 in the cell membrane and results in influx of extracellular calcium, causing elevated cytoplasmic calcium levels. So here's the very, we can see in this figure down here, we got the very detailed version. But, so this elevated cytoplasmic calcium levels results in large increased activation in calcineurin, which is a phosphatase, which activates transcription factor and fat. So the activation of NFAT, which is nuclear factor of activated T cells, family of transcription factors. And so when this happens in the resting T cells, inactive, so sorry. So when we have, we'll look at the activation of this, but first in a resting T cell, we have inactive NFAT, which is in the cytosol. This is phosphorylated. So the phosphorylated version of NFAT is inactive. The phosphorylation of NFAT inhibits nuclear transport. So then we have comodulin, which is activated by T-cell receptor signaling, induced incre which causes an induced increase in cytosolic calcium. Comodulin activates the enzyme calcineurin. Calcineurin is a phosphate and dysphosphorylates N-fat when it's currently phosphorylated and it's an active state. This, was, this activated N-fat enters the nucleus and causes cytokine expression of IL-2. So again, we have phosphorylation on serine and theranine residues keeps N-fat in the cytoplasm unstimulated. So again, it is phosphorylated. It's inhibited. Then calcium entry activates the serine, serine theranine phosphatase calcineurin, which dephosphorylates the N-fat, releasing it. So this dephosphorylated N-fat now enters the nucleus and acts as a gene transcription. Right here. So how does calcineurin work in blocking this process? So calcineurin inhibitors block single transduction. So again, we block with this signal through calcineurin inhibitors. And one example of this is cyclosporin A. This blocks transcription factor and fat activation and prevents T cell activation. Essentially keeps it in this inactive state. So how does it work? Calcineurin inhibitors form complexes with their cytosolic receptors or the immunophilins. And this complex binds to calcineurin and inhibits its activation. So here's our in, inactive calcin, calcineurin. We can see here, here's our immunophilin, which is essentially the drug. Comes in and now binds, inactivating it. This calcineurin is unable to dephosphorylate NFAT, and therefore NFAT is stuck in the cytoplasm and shuts down T cell activation. This inhibits key cytokine gene transcription and suppresses lymphocyte proliferation. So immunosuppressants like cyclosporin A or CSA and Tacrolimus, or FK506, inhibit T cell activation by blocking the action of phosphatase calcineurin, so the transcription factor NFAT is not activated, and the T cell activation is short circuited. So, the T cell activation pathway here are the main events. Again, this is a great summary figure. So, essentially, here's a place where we can inhibit calcineurin and here's a kind of like stop and start points where we stuff must happen for it to continue so here's our plc area and here's our binding so t-cell interaction with presented immuno antigen causes kinase activation again we have our lick and zap 70 and these cause the recruitment of scaffold and adapter proteins we can see here then we have phospholipase c or plc gamma Activation, which results in diacylglycerol and IP3 mobilization. And remember, we had that pathway where they split off. And these result in their downstream events. These include kinase pathways and calcineurin activity. And the activation of the transcription factors NFAT, NF-kappa B, and AP1. So again, we'll take another, another look at some defects. So ZAP70 mutations. So we've talked about ZAP70, but now we'll talk about a little more detail. 
So ZAP70 is essential for signal transduction after T cell receptor binds to antigen. So a ZAP70 mutation results in the loss of T cell activity and has an impact on B cells and also causes SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency disease, type severe combined immunodeficiency disease. ZAP70 plays a critical role in mature T cell function. We can also have CD3 chain mutations, which can also occur but are very rare and result in the loss of T cell signaling ability. And this is, again, you can go to the this website to learn more about SCID and all the different types. So again, we have our pathway and then it branches to our IP3 DAG, resulting in an activation. We can also have a defect in NEMO or IC gamma. This prevents NFK kappa B activation and results in immunodeficiency as well. So this is again a good figure to summarize pretty much most of what we talked about. But again, that's not enough. So here we have one signal, which is all the stuff we just talked about with our transcription factors, but we need a second signal. And this is our co-stimulatory signal. T cells need more than just sing signal one. Signal one is where our T cell receptor recognizes the peptide MC complex. We have our signal transduction and all the transcription factor activation we talked about with NF capital B, NFAT, and AP1. But and again, this needs our CD3 and zeta chains, and this is strengthened by interactions with MHC class 2 with CD4. Now, signal 2 depends on co-stimulatory accessory molecules. So CD28 on T cells must interact with B7 on an antigenic cell. So I've said this before, CD8 is B71, and CD86 is B72. We can see this. So it's actually B71 or within this complex. And CD28 is important, as there's other medications that work with this co-stimulatory signal. So why is this signal needed? Signal 2 is transduced through CD28 interactions with B7 on antigen-dependent cells. So this B7 to CD28 interaction results in the phosphorylation of CD28 and PI3 kinase activation to PIP3 production and the recruitment of kinases involved in cell activation and survival. This activates AKT, which is another protein kinase. This act of AKT promotes cell survival and metabolic activity which is very important. So we can have cells, T cells, that, let's just say in an autoimmune, we randomly produce the T cell that can react against our own antigen. So here's our antigen. It binds, the T cell binds, but it knows it's a self molecule, so there's actually no CD28 on it. So it, without CD28, it won't bind, have the costumatory molecule, and the reaction will never occur. So this essentially is used as a self-preservation mechanism and not and to prevent overactivation. Anyways, so we here this activates ITK, the tyrosine kinase, which induces PLC gamma activation, which you discuss in the transcription factor activation, and this provides essentially an extra level of control over T cell activation. And here we can see PDK is here. So again, here's our first things we discussed about the MHC and the T cell receptor, and then we have our B7 and CD28. Here's our PI3 kinase and our PIP2. So we have the B7 induces CD28 phosphorylation and activates our PI3 kinase to produce PIP2. PIP3 recruits PDK and AKT, allowing PDK to phosphorylate and activate AKT. PIP3 also recruits IKT and phosphor phosphorylates PLC gamma, resulting in the similar structure we've seen before. So essentially, we can have the convergence of multiple signals. So transcription factor binding to the IL-2 gene promoter integrates multiple signaling pathways into one output, IL-2 production. So we have, again, the first signal, the second signal, our PLC gamma activation, essentially doubling down on this pathway. And then again, we have our IP3 pathway with calcium and calcineurin. Then we have our DAG. Protein kinase and F kappa B or AP1, like we said, and fat. So essentially, we, we can see they're the same transcription factors, but it's occurring at multiple places. And again, these are all result in overlapping functions, but it makes it more powerful. And then again, IL2 production. So, why are these molecules so essential? Why is this interaction between B7 and 28 necessary? It is necessary because it provides extra level of control over T cell activation. 
but also enhances the signaling process. It increases IL-2 transcription rate, increases IL-2 production, and increases stability of IL-2 mRNA. So it's not just a self-preservance mechanism, it also improves our response. So again, here's our B7C28, B728. Communication between various cells of the immune system relies on cell contact, on cell contact dependent signals, again, our T cell, MAC, B7, with CD8, as well as soluble signals from cytokines. So again, we have our T helper cell also releasing cytokines here, which sometimes is IL-2. So what is the role of interleukin-2, which you've mentioned so much? So IL-2 is a key cytokine involved in T cell activation. Originally named as T cell growth factor, which kind of makes more sense, but now it's all labeled as IL-2. CD28 co-stimulation of activated T cells induces expression of IL-2 in the high affinity IL-2 receptor, or IL-2R. There's both alpha, beta, and gamma chains of the IL-2 receptor, which you can see here. So in a naive T cell, we don't have this fully, we have moderate affinity, but in our activated T cell, we add the alpha chain, and we have very high affinity for IL-2. The IL-2 receptor has a moderate affinity form with beta and gamma chains, like we said, and a high affinity with alpha, beta, and gamma. T cell activations induces alpha chain synthesis, so here's our alpha chain, forming the high affinity IL-2 receptor. So naive T cells express a moderate affinity IL-2 receptor, so these are non-activated T cells. So T cell interaction with the APC signals derived through the T cell receptor CD3 and CD28, so our first and second signals, results in T cell activation, and then there'll be increased expression of IL-2 and IL-2 receptor genes and the synthesis and secretion of IL-2 and expression of IL-2 receptor alpha chain for the high affinity, which results in high affinity IL-2 receptor. These activated T cells express high affinity IL-2 receptor and also secrete IL-2, so essentially stimulating itself. So this allows for assistant efficient autocrine activation by IL-2 and T cell proliferation and expansion into many identical effector T cells, having an, causing an effective response. So the IL-2 receptor, again, is made up of three chains, the high affinity, alpha, beta, gamma. The beta and gamma chains is the moderate. And alpha, beta, gamma is the high affinity. So again, this figure basically sums up what I've just said, if you want to take a look. So how are they turned off? So I mentioned that certain things can be used. So here's our CDLA4 and P7. So essentially, this replaces the CD28, but we'll get to it. So CDLA4 is an inhibitory receptor for B7 both CD80 and 86 molecules. So naive T cells that express CD28, which interacts with B7 on APCs, delivers a co signal in T cell activation. These activated T cells begin to express increased levels of inhibitory receptor CDLA4. So essentially the T cells know that once they're activated, they start to slowly progress these as they know they need to stop. So they have like an intrinsic mechanism to cause their inactivation. So this signal 2 can be modified by additional interactions. Signals from B7 on the APC are intercepted by the CDLA4 on the T cell, and this downregulates T cell activation due to the lack of CD28. So this kind of slowly occurs as our immune response happens. Because as our immune response goes up, goes on, the virus or whatever pathogen goes down, so we just need less and less T cells. We don't want to be overactive. We'll have our memory cells being developed, so we have CDLA4 come in to shut it down. So as we said, it downregulates T cell activity. So CDLA4, also called CD152, has a higher avidity for B7, so it actually binds more strongly to CD8. It wins the competition. So CDLA4 binds the most or all of the B7 molecules. It blocks interaction of B7 with CD28 and stops co stimulating singling, and the outcome is the downregulation of T cell proliferation. CDLA4 interaction with B7 has a downregulatory effect. That's very important. Due to, comp due to essentially winning the competition with CD28, binding for B7. CD28 has a one-to-one -one interaction with B7, but, sorry, but one dimer of CDLA4 can interact with two different dimers of B7 and has higher affinity binding avidity. So here we can see we have a one-to-one, -one, but here we can see two-to-one, essentially. So here we have an, I believe this animation, yep, there it goes. So here we can see the activation of a naive T4 lymphocyte by an antigen-presenting cell 
and its subsequent proliferation and differentiation into effector CD4T lymphocyte. So T cells receiving a full set of signals can enter cell cycle and there'll be activation and proliferation. Then it is downregulated by the B7 CD4 later interaction. But what if only T cell signals are delivered at first? We'll get to this answer in a second. So again, here's the animation again. Yeah. So the consequences of insufficient signaling. Antigen recognition in the absence of co-stimulation leads to functional inactivation or clonal deletion of peripheral or T cells. So this outcome results in energy. So T cells can become non-responsive to further stimulatory signals delivered through the T cell receptor. Energy is a regulatory process to prevent inappropriate T cell activation and results in incomplete signaling is a mechanism. This incomplete signaling is a mechanism to induce T cell tolerance. So here we have a core stimulation signal and specific signal, specific signal alone, co-stimulatory signal alone, no effect. So essentially this is what I talked about earlier where if we have our cell like we see here, does not express, we don't see the binding between our B7 and C28. So essentially this normal antigen presenting cell, so this will be, for example, will be a self cell. So just random, our kidney cell. Our kidney cell is not gonna express the pathogen, this co signal, because it doesn't wanna get attacked. Compared to anti APC that is infected or something like that, we're not gonna have that issue. So this won't occur without this binding, essentially it becomes energized, and essentially it becomes tolerized to this antigen. So now it's gonna know it's not something we need to attack. But there are exceptions. And again, it takes more than just the antigen. So the T cell receptor recognizes, so we can see here, recognizes antigenic peptide MSC presented by the APC. So our T cell receptor in MSC class two. CD3 and CD4 co receptor induce intracellular signal processes. Then we have our second signal, where we're co similar signal by the, by the same APC. CD28 on the T cell interacts with the B7 and the delivery of the second signal, which causes IL-2 and IL-2 receptor production, causing increased T-cell proliferation, promoting a survival. Then we have third, which is differentiation. So subsets of effector T-cells depends on the third signal from the antigen presenting cell. So these include cytokines that control T-cell differentiation, differentiation. So here we can see a bunch of different kinds. So different sets of cytokines being released can affect which type of T-cell is produced. And different T cell subsets interact with other cell types, and these choreograph the immune response. So again, some here are some more strategies for blocking T cell activation, mainly in immuno to immunosuppress certain people. So here essentially is a huge figure of all the different things where we can come in and block. So we talked about cyclosporin blocking calcineurin. So here are other examples. So for example, we have Patelicept, which is an in, which inhibits co-stimulatory signal with anti-CD8 molecules, antibody, sorry. So again, anti-CD8 gets rid of our CD8, can have T-cell activation. We can also inhibit T-cell signaling with signaling inhibitors to block NFAT, which we talked about with cyclosporin. We can also inhibit IL-2 signaling with anti-IL-2, lexilamab. We can see here, and there's other examples there. So yeah, we might get into this more to do later, but I hope you guys liked that one. That was a long one, a little dry, but I hope you learned something. See ya.